Brothers and sisters, we begin with praise and gratitude as that is the natural recognition of where we came from and our ultimate worth. Every one of us here is a manifestation of divine mercy and grace. So we should live and breathe and speak and call to the praise of the Almighty. Guidance is what distinguishes us from animals. The fact that we have this special conscious moral awareness of ourselves and our role in the world around us, it makes us responsible. And when we look at the favors that we have, and we look at the means that we have, we should feel the onus of working for the spiritual, even before the onus of working for the material gains that we all have to take care of to live our lives. So I bear witness and declare that there is no deity except for God alone, that Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, was his final messenger that he sent to mankind so that we could all be a part of and realize the absolute compassion and mercy that is the divine. The Arabic word for legacy is miraf. Miraf is generally, you know, a derivative of the same thing that is referring to an inheritance. Meaning a legacy is something to be known and then passed down by generation. One hadith of the Prophet وسلم, or about the Prophet وسلم, is narrated about the legacy of the Prophets. What it means when we say, Wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. Because many, many people on this earth with different religions will say there is only one God. There is one supreme being who created and rules the universe and is all powerful. Most religions say that. It is that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was his final messenger, which distinguishes us. So Abu Darda, one of the great students of the Prophet وسلم, was sitting in Damascus in a mosque. And a man comes in and he looks like he has been on a long journey by the way he looks. So he walks up to Abu Darda and he says, uh, Are you Abu Darda, the companion of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم? And this man clearly was not living around the Prophet ﷺ. He said, yes. He said, I have heard that you speak uh, the scriptural truth and the, you narrate upon the Prophet's tongue ﷺ. He said, really? He says, and what brought you here? He said, I've come from the city of the Prophet ﷺ. I've come from Medina. Medina to Damascus back then is a big journey. And he said, and I'm here to visit you. He said, did you come on a business journey? He said, no, I did not come here for any business. He said, did you have any other relatives or something that you came? He said, no, I came here to talk to you. So he said, well, then I have a hadith for you. He says, I was once uh, sitting with the Prophet wasallam, And he told me that whoever would embark on a journey seeking beneficial knowledge, then God will make that person's path to heaven easy. He said, the angels descend and tend to the well-being of the knowledge seeker, and everyone seeks forgiveness for the knowledge seeker, even the fish in the sea. He said, the superiority of the scholar over the worshiper is like the uh, full moon in the night sky as it relates to the small stars around it. He said the scholars are the inheritors of the legacy of the prophets. He said the prophets did not leave any money for anybody to inherit. Rather they left divine knowledge and wisdom. So whoever would take that would have an abundance of goodness. So if we ponder over this beautiful hadith, which probably made that guy feel really good at that point. Then we will know that knowledge is not a matter of information. Unfortunately, a lot of people take religion as information. And that will not help us. And because a lot of Muslims have a lot of information about religion, does not make our situation in some great situation, as we see, looking at the Muslim world, here, there, and everywhere. We're not on the top. 
We are not some great civilization that is shining the light of divine truth and establishing justice all over the world. So it's important for us to take a good look at what the Prophet ﷺ, when he said ilm, what he meant. He meant a deep understanding of the divine. And then an understanding of our actual purpose of existence. And then the seriousness of ultimate, final, eternal accountability. And how that all relates to the reality that we're living in every single day. Not just theoretical, philosophical ideas, but practical, pragmatic ideas about how we live our lives. And that's what it means. قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرًا عَلَى بَصِيرًا The Prophet was told, tell the people, say, this is my path that I call to God upon. I'm doing that with deep insight and wisdom. A type of sight that's based upon understanding of reality and divine knowledge and how they relate. So when it says that the Prophet was given the book and the wisdom, many people say, well, the wisdom is just simply the sunnah. I would like to take a little bit deeper look at that. What is the sunnah? The sunnah is the actual practical living of the divine truth in a human being's life. That's wisdom. And the Prophet ﷺ was not living a life in the United States of America when he was living in Arabia. So surely there is a principle to why he did what he did that made what he did and what he did important. <coughs> and then that would translate to a different approach and perspective and ruling in a different situation, at a different time, in a different circumstance. And that actually we see in his own life in dealing with different people and different situations in which he gave different answers. And our great scholars, they have commented on that in all of the books of Islamic legal jurisprudence, usul al-fiqh. So Islamic history is filled with this richness of intellectual spirituality. And that is many sermons and we've touched on that before. But for the last three centuries there is no question that that legacy has dwindled massively. Which is why many of you are here right now. Because people saw in the lands they live that there was not a means to get a good education and have decent opportunity or that oppression became mainstream, which are all very contradictory to Islam. So you should see that Islam here is enabling you to receive the legacy of the prophets. So as we said, many Muslims can tell you, this is what you should believe. This is why you should or should not do such and such. But why or how we should do that and how it affects our lives and moves and inspires us to grow and serve, it's these questions we're having a hard time with. It's these questions when young people raised in a society built on critical thinking that they, there's a big disconnect in religion and culture as it relates to their growth as people born in this country. Because the parents are like, do and don't do and think and believe. Because why? Because I said so. And that is not an evidence. That is not wisdom. That is not knowledge. That is culture. That is the way people do stuff. Why? We don't know. So therefore, it is simply just an aspect of culture. It becomes a truth of wisdom and purpose and meaning when it's based and founded in an intellectualizing of scripture. So what we learn from this hadith is that to truly claim relation to the prophets and inherit from them, we must seek an understanding of revelation. And revelation was sent to regulate our personal, our family, our social and civic lives altogether. In other words, the reality that we live in is intended to be guided by a deep understanding of scripture. On that note, Martin Luther King Jr., we are, as a society here, celebrating his life and accomplishments and legacy. He led this movement that mirrored the Prophet ﷺ in many ways. Now, one time I will make this clarification because I heard it before. The brother said, why with all of the great Muslims we have, 
Why would you bring some non-Muslim to talk about? And why would you refer to him as a great person? Well, when the Prophet ﷺ sent letters to the rulers of non-Muslim empires, he said, Ya Azim al -Rum. It's, it's written in the authentic hadith of Tirmidhi that he addressed them, O great ruler of Rome. He's appreciating how people look at certain people and their place, whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim. This attitude of exclusiveness and us and them and we are and superiority and this some sort of uh, clash of civilizations, we need to drop that yesterday. This is not the prophetic legacy. <laughs> so, Martin Luther King Jr., he basically was known for a non-violent struggle to bring racial justice in this country. And that's the exact model the Prophet ﷺ used for 13 years, when the Muslims were in Mecca as a small minority, <coughs> oppressed by institutional structure, by the majority. People came to the Prophet and they said, yeah, if we go attack them, or we get together, or we assassinate them while they're sleeping, they were very frustrated for the abuse and humiliation they were going through simply because they said, God is one and we do not worship statues, and this man is receiving revelations and we follow him over any tribal, cultural thing that you guys are following. They didn't say, they didn't attack anybody. They didn't, they weren't rude. They just simply declared a different way of living. Abuse, humiliation, torture, murder, all of this. So they came first and the Prophet said, we cannot do this. We have to be patient, we have to have wisdom, we have to just stick to our guns of knowledge and the scripture and live by it and encourage each other to grow in the best way that we can. The achievements of Martin Luther King Jr. cannot be understated. It is crucial for anybody who is an American Muslim living in a time when the National Defense Authorization Act and the Patriot Act have been appropriated by the Congress and fully uh, rat ratified and legislated against Muslims. There is legislation that exists against Muslims. Many people in this room probably have been unfairly and unjustly treated by law enforcement at some point or another simply because you are a Muslim. If you want to get a lens of the blueprint of how to deal with that scenario, you start at Martin Luther King Jr. When Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat for a white person because they had a rule that black people have to sit in the ruggedy old back of the bus. That was a rule. They had a sign in the bus, blacks in the back. This is just back in 1956, so you know. It's not like, mashallah, America has been this great place for all this time. We're talking about in recent time when my dad was alive and well, <coughs> young man in college, this is what he lived in. And he saw himself superior to black people as a standard of society culture and law. One of the things Martin Luther King said, remember, don't forget, everything Hitler did in Nazi Germany was legal. Pay attention to that point. So when Walter Park said, I'm not going to give you my seat, I'm an old woman, I'm sitting at the front, I'm not going all the way back there. And then Martin Luther King Jr. started a boycott, started a movement, started marching, and what happened the next year, 1956, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that segregation on public buses is unconstitutional and that was now illegal. You see, it happened. Whoever says, oh, voting in politics, it will never work. You are used to a regime and a political structure that what you're talking about is true. We have to own our place in this country and see how do we establish ourselves here where we live, where we're raising our families and not judge it by some other reality that is irrelevant to where we live. King led the march in Washington for jobs and freedom, the famous I Have a Dream speech, in 1963. It motivated many other marches, and then it led to the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which basically was sweeping legislation against Jim Crow laws, and basically treated black people by law. Of course, the local racist systems, it took a long time until now, we still haven't really, you know, actually done everything we need to do to deal with it. So, um, 1964, King received the Nobel Peace Prize. He was the youngest person to ever receive it. He was 35 years old. He led the Selma March. If you have not seen the movie Selma, you should see the movie Selma. It's a, a true story. It's something that will definitely give you perspective of the history 
and where we stand and how. Because guess what the, the moving point in Selma was? When he appealed to white and Jewish and other people. Before that, the police were attacking them, smoke bombs, chains, hitting them with the you know, barbed wires, all kind of stuff. But when lots of white people came and joined them, when they formed a coalition of people who are not from their tribe on a moral basis, that is when they succeeded. So then, the 1965 Voting Rights Act were passed where black people could vote like everyone else. And now, many, many Republican legislatures, including right here in North Carolina, have made laws that basically are designed to stop black people from voting. That's right now, today, in 2018, all over the country. This is a Republican Party program. Half of the political structure of our country is doing this. So the secret of King's success was that he was a really big believer in God. He believed he was trusting in God. He read what Jesus Christ said. He read what the Bible said. And then he coupled that knowledge with knowledge of the U.S. Constitution, American history and culture, American politics and American, American media, and this is how he achieved collecting and <laughs> intertwining those knowledges and applying them with wisdom. And that's actually the Prophet Sallallahu too. Some people say ridiculous things like, you know, if the Prophet were here today, he would be just like he was back in Arabia back then. The Prophet Sallallahu was an Arab man. In the, in the seventh century, he was a modern guy living amongst his people like them. It changed when he received revelation. What changed about him, not his clothes, not that, he, not that he changed his eating style or the type of food he was eating. Culture did not change very much at all for him. It was his beliefs, his morals, his worship, his character. That's what distinguished him. He didn't become some separatist, as many people talk about in the Muslim community, so-called religious people. No, the Prophet ﷺ was one among his people. And he was relying upon and well studied in the political dynamic of his society. And if you study the Sirah well, you will see he took very calculated steps understanding the tribal class system that he lived in. And yes, he took the support of disbelievers in the political hierarchy of his society in order to reach his goals. That's a fact of history that cannot be denied. So the Prophet ﷺ was successful for similar reasons. So I want to give you some quotes before we leave here that are from Martin Luther King Jr. related to the legacy of the Prophets. Knowledge, education. He said, the function of education is to teach one to think critically. The Qur'an, time and time again. لِقَوْمِ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ لِأُولِ الْأَلْبَابِ لِأُولِ الْأَبْصَارِ We could go on and on and on. The Qur'an is a book for those who contemplate, those who ponder, those who rationalize, those who critically think. But yet many religious people are treating it like a book that's supposed to be literally understood and literally said and passed down as a um, simple informational guide to what it means to be a Muslim. Rather than a deep divine truth that will relate to time, circumstance and people in different ways. He said intelligence plus character, that is the true goal of education. And that's exactly what the Prophet taught. إِنَّمَا الْعِلْمَ بِالْتَعَلُّمْ وَإِنَّمَا الْحِلْمَ بِالْتَحَلُّمْ The Prophet said, True knowledge is through a rigorous process of learning and growing. It will never learn. Whoever thought I've learned the knowledge, I know knowledge, that person is a fool, according to the scholars. And then he, in the same hadith, he said, and forbearance and true patience and dealing with people will only be gained through a spiritual process of reflection about how I deal with people, how I'm perceived, and how the benefit or the harm is come and how to be on the right side of that equation. Martin Luther King Jr. said, nothing in the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance 
and conscientious stupidity. I think we can sum up the problem of the whole Muslim world with that statement. Sincere ignorance, people who really are good intended, well minded people, but they don't know what they're talking about in religion or in what's going on in reality. And so they're living a life and saying things that is based on ignorance, but they're very sincere about it. Or people who are thinking of plots and plans to do corrupt things in such sophisticated ways. So Martin Luther King said, nothing in the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. He said, to save man from the chaos of propaganda, in my opinion, is the chief aim of education. And then he commented later on that, he said, a great majority of the so-called educated people of the world do not think logically. Even the media, the classroom, and the pulpit, the member, in many instances, do not give us an objective, unbiased truth. It's true, Wallahi. It's true. You have to research, you have to study, you have to contemplate, you have to compare, you have to take from different sources of information. So many times I hear people saying things and they have this narrow lens. They have not really studied the issue. They have really not studied what they're talking about. They throw out the word haram like it's the word the, a, or an, or like it's some common word of language. So he said, education must enable one to sift and weigh evidence to discern true from false, the real from the unreal, the facts from the fiction. As Allah Azza wa Jal said, هَلْ يَسْتَوِ الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Do the people who truly know equal the people who do not know? أَقُولُ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَأَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ لِيُّ لَكُمْ فَاسْتَغْفِرُوا فَإِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ Make no mistake about it. You have come to a place where we have every intention of mobilizing people across a diverse spectrum of backgrounds to grow in knowledge and understanding as a spiritual family to affect change in society starting right here in Charlotte. We have every intention of building upon the legacy of the prophets and the legacy of anyone who followed that and to be of those who are successful eternally. We are here to work for the divine truth, to shine the divine light. So, if you would like to join in some sort of official capacity, spending a good 10, 20 hours of your month, um, we are going to be, as we have started Team Compassion, and they have been out working, doing many projects, in terms of bringing rahmah and compassion to the less fortunate, we have a committee of the green team which will be meeting next uh, month in order to plan certain projects and plans about how to become a green mosque and a green community and promote the health and the welfare of our environment as a community we will establish a, a civic engagement and community relations committee which are people who will be trained in a very specific way about how to present Islam to the non-Muslim community and I'm not talking about going trying to convert people on the corner of uptown I'm talking about a much more sophisticated prophetic reality in understanding how we relate to society and how can we easily communicate and effectively represent the beauty of the message of the Prophet ﷺ in Charlotte, North Carolina. So I encourage you, there will be a sign-up sheet. Um, I think there's one here and there may be one back there to, to think about signing up for this. And I encourage you to, when you get those emails with the newsletter, when you get that text message, Look into it. Maybe you already have something, and one of the shortcomings that we currently have, I will admit, and we need to work on this, is last minute programming. Next week, all of our uh, fellow humanity in the churches and the synagogues, they come to me right now about programs in November. Imam, we need you to come to our church on November 18th. And I'm like, yeah, okay, I'll figure it out. <laughs> We need to get our act together, and we are working on that. And that is something very much, that was something engraved in the scriptural truth of Islam. So I ask Allah to guide us, to make us among those who are guided, to be with us, to stand with us, to not allow our weakness and laziness to make us discredited, 
Ya Allah, we ask you to embrace us in your mercy in this life and hereafter, to give us wisdom and understanding and a deep reflection of scripture, to bring us together to study scripture and to see how that makes us live a healthy life. Make us a people who are unified on spirituality and not concerned about ethnic reality. Make us a people who are leaders of the righteous, who stand up for the truth and the justice, who do not stay silent and idle while injustice is being established and indoctrinated and legislated. Make us be a people who truly support others in what is morally right and do not support people in what is morally wrong. Make us a people who are educated, who are wise, who are compassionate, who are merciful, who reflect all of the beautiful traits of your oneness as it came through the example of the human Prophet wasallam. And make us among those who are resurrected in your presence, in your light, in your forgiveness, in the eternity of bliss in your heaven.